This is Twit. Hello, everybody, and welcome to i5 for the iPhone, episode 123. A sequential episode. Am I the only person who cares about this sort of thing? It is also our second to last show of 2014. Now, normally, i5 covers the latest iPhone apps and tips and tricks and news. But hey, we decided to record this special episode a little bit before the week of Christmas. A lot of us are at least enjoying a little time off with family and friends and reminiscing over the last 12 months and looking forward to the next 12. So I thought we'll at least start off doing a little reminiscing ourselves and look back on a big year for the iPhone. Number one, it was a big year for the iPhone. And when I say big, I really mean big. In September at Apple's annual iPhone event, CEO Tim Cook and his merry pranksters unveiled the new line of iPhones. Yes, plural, iPhones. A 4.7 inch iPhone 6 and also an iPhone 6 Plus, which is 5.5 inches on the diagonal. And basically, huge beyond belief. Now, I decided to go with the 6 Plus because I thought, well, why not go nuts? This is my job. I'll try something new. I'll see how crazy I can go. You might remember that I kind of hated it at first. I was I had a lot of buyer's remorse, even though Leo actually bought this, but you know what I mean. And then all of a sudden, I kind of didn't hate it, and then I really got used to it, and then I started to use my iPad less frequently to read things because my 6 Plus was pretty big already. And then I caught a glimpse of an iPhone 5S at a table at brunch one day. It was one of my friend's phone. And I couldn't believe it. I was like, no, that's not the same phone I used to use. I used to use that phone just several months ago. We adjust to size pretty quickly. And now even the iPhone 6 feels a little small to me. I know I'm not alone. This is a really common feeling among some of my peers who went 6 plus. You, something happens and you all of a sudden feel like you couldn't go back. In any case, Apple says that the two new iPhone models sold more in their opening weekend than any other iPhones before them. So it was a success. And speaking of the iPhone 6, data from the Consumer Intelligence Research Partners, which looked at the first 30 days of iPhone 6 and 6 Plus availability in the US, showed that the iPhone 6 accounted for 68% of all iPhone sales, while the 6 Plus took between 23 and 24%. So people like the 6. Number two. OK, so we're up to iOS 8.1.2. But just a few short months ago, iOS 8 hadn't even been released yet. Remember those dark days of iOS 7 and skeuomorphism? The horror. iOS 8 introduced all sorts of really great stuff, and a lot of it's centered around more openness for iOS, which traditionally is just not Apple's mission at all. They like to close that stuff down. We can now install third-party keyboards. That's something that Apple refused developers for years. The third-party keyboard market in the App Store has kind of exploded. People love it. Also, Apple's letting developers much deeper access to iOS itself. Third-party apps can also now use Touch ID as a privacy feature to unlock something rather than having to rely on passwords. iOS 8 has a ton of other new features as well, the Health app and, of course, HealthKit to connect to food and fitness apps. You can use Handoff to answer a phone call that comes into your iPhone on your Mac or your iPad. It always freaks me out, but it works. The photo app is certainly better. Messages now have new extras like built-in audio file support. Hey, I'm running late. Can't wait to see you. The notification center actually got useful. It's kind of pretty, too. There's all these icons and new information. The list goes on and on. OK, so iOS 8 is perfect and magical, except that it's also buggy. By the latest version, the big bugs have mostly been squashed. There was one, remember the one where people's cell service got cut out? But I continue, and I just feel like I've got to say this, I continue to have frequent app crashes in iOS 8 that I just never used to have. Mailbox, which is my default mail app, crashes every single day at least once. Facebook is always lagging when I launch it without fail. Sometimes I get a black screen. Sometimes it doesn't open at all. It's stuff like that. iOS 8 looks fabulous. But there's a smoothness that's lacking there. I never used to have such app crashes. Now again, iOS 8 will continue to update. Apple now rolls out frequent updates, even if they aren't fixing a major issue. So we're moving in the right direction. But and it tries my patience sometimes. Number three, we got an email from Eva, who wants more control over when her texts are sent. Eva writes, 
I often have the desire to send someone a text, but at a later time. For instance, as I'm getting ready for work, I remember that I need to ask my daughter a question. It's 6 a.m. She lives two time zones away, and it's 4 a.m. to her. I don't want to text her right now. I also don't want to forget about it, nor do I want to set a reminder and then send it later because I would rather just do it all right now. I'm in search of an app that will let me write out a text and send it at a specific time in the future. This seems like an easy enough request, but I can't find an app that does this. Well, Eva, since you explicitly said you don't want to remind yourself to schedule a text later, I will not give you that advice, although that would have been my advice. I'm just gonna go ahead and be Captain Obvious for a second and say, Instead of finding a solution to sending a text when you feel like it, just send the text. Your daughter will read it when she wakes up or when she has time. It's not going anywhere. That's kind of the beauty of texting. That's why people like it so much, even though it's somewhat passive. Phone calls are disruptive. Texting really isn't. By the way, I use my iPhone as an alarm every morning, and I also have a bunch of friends in different time zones all over the world, and they text me at all hours. And I just turn my ringer off when I go to sleep. The alarm, by the way, will always still work, even if you've set your phone to mute, something good to remember, completely fine. I get up, I get my text notifications sitting there, I text back, or I don't. I really don't think it has to be that immediate. Anyway, I'm not trying to tell you how to live your life, but I say just text now and be done with it. Number four, we got an email from Shanna, who has an Apple Pay question. Shanna writes, I have two credit cards issued from the same bank, one personal, one business. I do have my personal set as my default, but they look the same. Is there any way to name the credit card so I can be sure I'm not charging the wrong account? Not real good at remembering account numbers. Well, Shanna, unfortunately, and I went in and figured that there was probably some way to do this, it doesn't look like you can rename your cards or give them different skin colors or anything like that. Apple restricts pretty heavily, which probably at least has something to do with an agreement that uh, Apple has, has made with all of the banks that it's partnered with for Apple Pay. They tend to like things a little cut and dry. There doesn't even seem to be a way to reorder them, although maybe if you deleted one of the cards and then add another card in between and then add the, I don't think that'll work either though because Apple Pay is gonna wanna lump the same bank together. I'm not sure how big of a problem this is because my credit cards, I have a debit and a credit, are different banks and different colors. But I'd love to know if any of you have this problem, and if so, how you are coping might be a solution. I5 at twit.tv with your stories, please. Finally, number five, let's give a little appreciation for Apple's editor's pick for iPhone app of the year. 2014 gives it up for Elevate. We've talked about Elevate in the past on i5. It's a brain training program that's supposed to help you improve focus and your speaking skills and processing speed, even your memory. <laughs> that's actually something I could really use. Math skills as well. Each user gets a personalized training program that adjusts over time depending on how you're scoring. The more you train with Elevate, the more you're supposed to improve critical cognitive skills that help you be more productive and even help you earn more money. In fact, the app claims in its developer notes that users who train at least four times per week have reported dramatic gains and increased confidence, and who doesn't like confidence? The reason that I think Elevate is so great is because the tests are fun. They're tests that are masquerading as games, so you're actually having a good time, and it's good to when you get the things right. In fact, 25 games for critical cognitive skills like focus, memory, processing, math, precision, and comprehension are all in there. Elevate also has performance tracking, so you can go back and see how you've been doing over time. Daily workouts for your specific skill set, depending on how you've answered in the past. A workout calendar that's supposed to help you stay motivated. And the design is just great. I can see why Apple loves this app so much. There is nothing wrong with it. It looks good, it makes you smarter, it's free, it's an editor's pick dream. That is it for this edition of i5. Thanks everybody. All of the apps and links and other information from this show and any of our other episodes is at twit.tv slash i5. You can of course email your ideas or questions or feedback to us at i5 at twit.tv. Leave us a voicemail if you want me to hear your voice at 614 on i5. I'm Sarah Lane and I'll see you next time on i5 for the iPhone. In fact, I'll see you next year. No, shoot. No, we have one more show in 2014. I'll see you next week. Bandwidth for i5 for the iPhone is provided by Cashfly. 
at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. <laughs>